So guys, forgive us. We were a little late. Uh, we thought we were live and found out we were just talking to the air. So we're going to cut to the chase. Um, if you read what's going on with us, um, we have an engagement uh, in the next hour and a half or so. So you don't have to worry about us taking a whole lot of time. We're going to deal with our word today, which is repentance. And Myra had a practice run because she's already gone through a portion of what she was going to share. I'm going to have her do it again so that you all get it. With that said, baby, can you just pray us in? Good morning, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of, son, of your son, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for your presence with us all, all the time. May we remember this and act accordingly through our day, through the way we respond to people, how we even present ourselves before people, because we're presenting ourselves before you in every moment. We love you. We honor you. We thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our topic today is repentance. It's just to make a change of mind, heart, and action by turning away from sin and self and returning to God. Now, most of us know this, but just in case somebody tuned in who doesn't know about repentance, this is a heartfelt conviction of sin, a contrition that it just like breaks your heart over the offense to God, a turning away from the sinful way of life and turning towards God, honoring him in our way of life. Jesus, our Lord, preached repentance. He had just heard that John the Baptist was in prison, and he's talking to the people in Matthew 4, 70, 17. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And did they understand that? So from the Lord's words, we know that to enter into God's kingdom, we must confess and repent to him. Repentance does involve turning from all sin and dead works, but it must be more than that. Because there are people who are righteous in their own selves. They determine, I'm not going to sin. I'm going to walk in integrity. But if they don't turn, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, it requires turning to the living and true God by faith in Jesus Christ and filling the life with appropriate deeds of righteousness. And we are not righteous of ourselves. The righteousness comes from God. The apostle Paul is another classic example of genuine repentance. This man opposed the Christians. He thought he was doing a righteous thing in his own sight. And he locked them in jail, even had them murdered until God rebuked him. Paul repented of his sin and turned away from his sin. His life was a picture of continual transformation. Psalms 51 is a famous poem by King David after he ordered the, the murder of Uzziah, Uriah, sorry, so he could have Uriah's wife as Sida. Those in second dose, second Samuel 11, 12, <laughs> you read about that. In the Psalm, David cried out to God, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And that was when he realized that he was walking in his own lust, that it wasn't God. He had a relationship, but it wasn't profound because he allowed himself to walk away. He was comfortable in his life. And sometimes we do that. We become too comfortable and things are going so well, but we can never be that comfortable that we don't realize that Christ is with us, his sacrifice, his love for us through the cross. In the book of Acts, when Peter was talking to the people about Jesus Christ, they wanted to know, what shall I do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's a cancellation of the death. There's no more penalty. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's in Acts 2.38. The very first thing they were told to do in order to have remission, cancellation of that debt, of their sin was to repent. And we look at Psalm at Romans 32. It it not sorry, 32, 22, sorry. 
6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no penalty. Jesus paid the price. Now we're paying. We're receiving wages for our sin. But this is a this is a gift. The gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what Peter was talking about. And then you have this right before 623 it says, but now you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I really got into Romans 20, I keep saying 22, Romans 6, read it. It talks a lot about our sin and how we are no longer in that sin and how we have fruit that we should be evident in our lives. It's a beautiful chapter of Romans. Mm -hmm. The apostles also preach repentance. Jesus talked to them before he left, Jesus said in Luke 24, 46, 47, thus is it, it is written that the Christ, talking about himself, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin shall be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. That's Luke 24, 46, 47. And he's telling them, that they need to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until they are endued with a power from on high. We get this gift of the Holy Spirit because we can't do it in ourselves. But the power of the Holy Spirit gives us an advantage over that sin that so easily besets us. But we have that power. We can't walk around and say, I'm a sinner. We're not sinners. We have repented and we have that power. The times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And that's Acts 17, 30, 31. Listen, the times of ignorance God overlooked. No more. And one illustration of sorrowing over sin is Job. Precious Job, who was a righteous man who loved the Lord, but the enemy wanted to test him. And you know what? We need to be tested from time to time. Because Job was a good man. But the, even in his goodness, he saw something in himself that he didn't realize. Because there we go again. Back to David. David was comfortable. Job was comfortable, even though he, he rose up every day and praised the Lord and prayed. But there was something in him that was settled, like, oh, it's always good. God is always there. But he wasn't allowing the reality that it, we need to exa examine ourselves because there's always areas in our lives that need to be examined, that we need to allow the Lord to purify and even in this time of, of being troubled and talked against, his so-called friends, you know, just really beating him up in his time of, tr of trouble, he saw something in himself. And he realized that, I have heard of you. He's talking about the Lord by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Eternal, internally, he sees his God. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes because he recognized there was still more and more of him that needed to repent to truly come before the Lord. And even in our selfishness, even in our comfort, we need to repent because there's things we need to be about our father's business. And that's Job 42, 5 and 6. Only when we realize that we have offended a holy and righteous God and that our sins are piled as high as the sky, can we truly come to God in faith. The Bible says, now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. 
for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world produces death and that's sent second corinthians 7 9 to 10 but the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness but is long suffering towards us not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance that's second peter 3 9 god doesn't just give us one chance to repent he is remarkably patient and he is kind towards us in romans 2 4 he says or do you despise the riches of his goodness forbearance and long suffering not knowing that the goodness of god leads to repentance the goodness of god repentance leads to life for everyone muslims buddhists everyone peter confronted by the apostles when he had come back talking to the gentiles about the encounter he had with the gentile man when he saw the sheet coming down and this 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 roman had the same encounter and and he had to realize that god was speaking something different that he was opening up a door not only for the jews to come to know jesus christ their messiah but for everyone in acts 11 18 he's talking to the the assembly of the jewish leaders who are now in christ who are questioning did christ is being spoken to the gentiles those infidels that's us but in acts 11 18 when they heard what he was saying when they heard these things they became silent and they glorified god because he was telling him how god was doing a work saying that God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. That's how he is. He is not a respecter of persons. That man on the street that looks like he is, he 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 looks like the gutter because he's been in the gutter so long, mm. you don't even see him anymore. You walk past him like he's nothing. But he is something in God's eyes. In God's eyes, he knows this man has a potential, not because of anything he has, but because of what God has for him to bring him out of that gutter, to bring him into the light. We all need that. A re unrepentant heart leads to death. In Old Testament, Jeremiah cried out to the Lord. In Jeremiah 5, 3, he says, Oh Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Another version says they have refused to repent. And that's Old Testament, but doesn't that sound like something that we need to hear in this generation, in this world, in this time? they have refused to repent the most tragic thing in all the world is when when sinners remain hard-hearted they don't heed the call of the gospel to repent and believe the good news mark 1 15 mm. and he said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe in the gospel Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. Again, guys, I want to um, welcome a few of you. Um, Elizabeth Abel, want to welcome Ralph Davis, want to welcome uh, my main man all the way in Pakistan, Joshua. All right. It's good to have you here. Susan Clark, our one of our favorites. She's <laughs> always with us. God bless you. Uh, buddy, if you're still there, great to have you. And um, anyone else, if I missed you, um, it's because of the technology, because they don't always give me every name. And then I, when I look at the rebroadcast, I find out, wow, there's a lot more people on here than I thought. Nevertheless, 
Uh, first of all, we apologize again that we started a little bit late. Um, technical issue on our side. And we also want to just make sure you understand this is just a, a one time thing as far as this early morning hour. N normally we are on at 5 p.m. But uh, today, because we're going to be out most of the day um, in ministry, uh, we wanted to still uh, not forsake the assembling and still do what we do because we love you guys so much. With that said, isn't it amazing how Myra and I have the same word, repentance, <laughs> and uh, within the plethora of scripture references that she gave, she knows she hit one of mine, which is Psalm 51. Yeah. And I'm going to be there a little bit, but I'm going to actually go into the text from the actual passage that leads up to why Psalm 51 was written, which is 2 Samuel 12. And I'm going to just be reading, I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Believe me, it won't be as long as you think. Um, but when we're talking about repentance, we are talking about more than just saying, I'm sorry. And I think that that's the, the main thing that we want to get across today, that repentance is literally a turning away from what we understand, what the Holy Spirit has convicted us to be things that are not of God. And, you know, when we realize these things, and sometimes that's a process, we don't always know that we are actually doing things that are going against God until we get to know God more. And then we realize, oh my goodness, I've done this, I've done that, and I need to turn away from this. And interesting enough, um, God always sends a servant in order to deliver a message. Now, it takes a lot of bravery for that servant because in the case that I'm getting ready to read, it could have cost him his life just by delivering the message. And we need to understand that to relate that to today's uh, way of life and the atmosphere that we live in today. If you are really in Christ, you not only become a new creature, but you begin to say things that go against the world flow. And in doing so, you can be hated. In doing so, you can be ostracized and ridiculed. And so we have to determine in our sharing, you know, whose team are we actually on? And do we have enough confidence to rely on God and not to just look at the comments and uh, the attitudes of men. With that said, I'm going to just go ahead, get into this text, and be done with this for today. We have a hard deadline. So for you guys to say, oh, Mac is always so long. <laughs> well, you don't have to worry about that today. So let's open up our Bibles or our phones or whatever uh, electronics you might use in order to read the word. I'm actually reading from the New King James Version. And again, it's 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. And this is what the text says. It says, then the Lord sent Nathan. And Nathan is the person that took it. You know, he trusted in God to deliver what he's getting ready to deliver. Uh, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. David is the king, all right? And he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished 
and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. In other words, instead of opening up the table and his resources to receive this person, mm -hmm. he decided to go elsewhere being selfish in his own provisions. And this means something because there's selfishness that also comes oftentimes with the need to repent. Let me continue at verse five. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, this is the thing that oftentimes we get caught up in when we are receiving a message or hearing a story about a situation. Oftentimes we are quick to make judgment mm -hmm. because we don't realize that part of the reason why that story or that message is being delivered is that the person who is the messenger is one who is uh, trying to tell us something. And we might be at that moment a little too dense to actually receive the message that's being given. And ultimately, as we read this, it's not so much the message that Nathan is giving, it's really the message that God mm -hmm. has given to Nathan in order to share with David. So now David is, oh man, he's upset and man, he's literally calling on the life of this person with no pity and man, telling this person, man, not only do you need to restore, but you need to restore four times over, okay? This is like indignation. And from David's point of view, mm -hmm. preachers would say, I'm still the man. But <laughs> Nathan is saying, you are the man. As I continue, thus says the Lord God of Israel. Notice Nathan didn't say it of his thoughts. It wasn't his feelings. It wasn't his emotions. He's saying the Lord has said this. And this is what he said. This is God speaking now. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. You know, Saul was on the attack of David. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have given you much more. Could you, yeah. could you imagine that? Even David, yeah. he could have given David all of these things. But God, he loved David so much that he said, but if that wasn't enough, my son, I would have given you so much more. I mean, can you, can you understand mm -hmm. the humility of an all-knowing, all-present, mm -hmm. all you know, all giving, all powerful God saying, I'm going to really bow my will to you. If that's not enough, 
I'll give you more. Can you imagine God saying that to us today? <laughs> I'll give you more. We keep crying out to him. One of my favorite songs is, uh, I think it's Roseanne. Uh, what's her name? Roseanne. I can't think of her last name now. But um, uh, jo no, not Roseanne. Joanne Rosario. Joanne Rosario, who has this song that just says more, more, more. You know, and so... Imagine God just opening up the portal of communication and saying, oh, my beloved Myra, my beloved uh, uh, Elizabeth Abel, my beloved Susan Clark, I want to give you more, okay? And all we have to do is be in the mode of receiving. Amen. Oh my goodness. I just couldn't. I can't even fathom this, right? So in verse nine, it says, Now this is God, the, the same God who's that powerful and that loving says, Why have you dis, uh, despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? He broke God's heart. Mm -hmm. Mm. You have killed Uriah. You heard uh, Myra mention that earlier. You killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Mm. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. He set Uriah up to be on the front line of a battle that he knew they would lose just because he saw a woman from his view on the rooftop mm. bathing. This is what lust will do. It will have you wipe out a whole person, murder a whole person because selfishness got in the way of holiness. Now, verse 10, it says, now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. And I'm going to tell y'all a little story about this in a minute. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, S-U-N. For you did in secret, or you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun, S-U-N. And so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Ah, reality clicked in. Now, what started out as a statement, you are the man. Now the man has realized he's the man. This is where we have to think about what do we do with that? After we know we're the man, we're the woman, what do we do with that? Now I'm going to interject Psalm 51 into this, right at Psalm 51, verse 1. And then I'm going to tell you my story. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me <laughs> against you. You only have I sinned 
and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And guys, I got to tell you, this is where the story kicks in, my story. I came to that same realization that I was the man. And it was the hardest pill that I ever had to swallow because to openly admit that, and even to this day, it breaks my heart that I have to say what I'm getting ready to say. But you can be guilty and you can try to play it off as if you haven't done anything wrong and you can come up with all kinds of excuses, which is what I was doing in my own mind. So I'm going to be transparent right now. In my first marriage, and that's one of the reasons why I have to say this, in my first marriage, I had to own the fact that I was the man. What does that mean? It means not even indulging in physical sex, but just the very lust that was going on internally in me. Because again, like David has said here, against thee, God, and him only have I committed this wrongdoing. I can't blame anybody. I will refuse to blame the devil because the devil really doesn't make you do anything. And I wish we would grow up and understand that because if we did, we would then own our mistakes and even the harder part, live with the consequences of those mistakes. And this is the thing. I had to confess first to God, and then I had to confess to that first wife that, man, my eyes, and really not even my eyes as much as my heart, went away from that union. Just because you didn't do anything physically doesn't mean that you are not just as guilty of the crime. And I had to say it. And I remember when I had to say it. And I remember it all came out of other things that I was doing that was just outside the will of God, dealing with alcohol and trying to fit in with guys that were running the streets and guys I should have never been connected to. And right around the time of my own salvation, so I would have been 29 years old, is when I realized I could not live the lie any longer. Because if I had kept going, I would have done the do all the way. And I would have been guilty even from a worse advantage point, mm -hmm. because now I would have actually given my body, my physical body, to a relationship that was not under the covenant of marriage. And I have to not only confess that, but I have to tell you, just like what happened with David, that there were consequences that occurred. And as the scripture tells us, these things were right within the family. Now, I'm not going to get into the actual details of what that meant in my family, because that involves other people who have not given permission or have not received permission to share these things. But just trust me on this, that my indiscretions mm -hmm. created a wall. I can say this, a wall between that first wife that never, ever truly got repaired. But it also created walls within other members of my household, immediate and uh, externally. It created a change and a shift even in 
my I like I don't like to say it, but my church life, let's just say the assembling that I was going to, it created all kinds of ripples that were devastating to me, yet I understood because of Psalm 51 that these were the things that I had to go through. This was the price that was paid for my indiscretion, okay? And, you know, this is the hard lesson that all we can do is turn away. This is where the repentance comes in. We turn away, but don't expect that there won't be consequences for those things that you have previously done. But also know this, and this is where the joy kicks in, that my God, joy truly does cometh in the morning because I can sit here with all of my Facebook and YouTube family and say, but God has been so good to me. He has been so merciful to me. He has been so faithful to me that even though I am in a situation where I'm still trying to uh, repair some of the damage that's been done, nevertheless, he loves me uncompromisingly because I have given my life to him. I will never, ever do those things again because my God has shown me that he loves me and that my repentance, my turning away from those things can give me a hope eternal in his kingdom. Hey. <laughs> With that said, bringing things back to 2 Samuel, I want to go finally to uh, the last part of the verses that I put out there. So I'm still in verse 13, and then we'll be wrapping this up. And Nathan said to David, and this is the joy, y'all, this is it. The Lord also has put away your sin. Hmm. I've been saying this <laughs> episode after episode after episode. I refuse to live under the moniker of sinner. Not now. Because Jesus Christ died that all of my sin is washed away. It doesn't mean that 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 I won't sin again. It no. Understand what I'm saying here. The penalty and the price that's paid for that sin is no longer God has already so I can live in a different kind of existence as opposed to going back to the slop that we call sin and just over and over again, well, give me my sin, Lord. And like I'm putting Jesus right back on the cross and he's got to die all over again because of me. No, it, it's over. When he said it was finished, it truly is finished, y'all. And if you don't get anything out of this, in repentance, you can actually declare, Jesus finished it. He finished it. Now, I'm just trying to make my life match his life. And that's a lifelong pursuit. We're always in perfecting mode. But God looks at us through his image of already being perfected. Do you not understand that? He doesn't look at us the way we look at ourselves. We know that we're flawed. I look every day and say, oh my gosh, he uses this? <laughs> no, but God looks at us from a whole different kind of lens because he knows if we're being for real in our salvation or not. He knows it, mm -hmm. okay? He knows it, all right? He knows when we struggle. He knows when we're going through but it's different. We're not just openly doing these things in defiance of him. We're doing this in the struggle and he helps us through the struggle if we confess that we got a problem. The
reason I can freely talk about my business is because I've overcome that. And even though prices are still being paid, nevertheless, God has forgiven me. And you know what? I accept his judgment. Mm. Praise the Lord. So lastly, Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. This is not natural death. This is eternal death. You shall not die. However, here we go. However, because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Check this out, y'all. There are repercussions that go beyond us. We kill our witness mm -hmm. when we go outside of God. We don't think about it that way. We look at our immediate family. We look at our friends. We look at associates, co-workers, whatever you want to call them. But we don't think about the witnesses that we're killing that could lead people to curse God. And this is the other part of the situation I'm dealing with within certain parts of my family that there are certain parts of my family that have totally walked away from God. And I have to own my responsibility for that because I never gave them a chance to actually accept God on their terms because I gave an example that was poor. That is the true confession, y'all. And this is mm. serious that we don't want to continue to do these things because it destroys generation after generation after generation. And I'm praying even now that the generation that I have already affected would be able to come out of my mess to be able to experience God for themselves. I don't want the credit for it. I just want them to be delivered and made free in Christ. And lastly, when we do these things, as the scripture says, giving great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Do you know what blaspheme is? It is going and talking and living against the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how deep that is. It then says, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. I just want to leave with this. Our refusal to repent could kill off future family members, friends, associates, and Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I don't want murders mm -hmm. on my ledger. Okay. And so as we, we wrap this thing up, I pray that between Myra and I, that we sufficiently covered this particular word. This word was one I submitted because you don't hear about it too much in the pulpits. They're going to hear about it today where I'm going, I think. Um, but this message, salvation, repentance, reconciliation, these words that we have been uh, talking about over the past few weeks, abide. These words are foundational words. Uh, next week, my uh, gender issues and for uh, social uh, justice issues is not what the pulpit is for. It's to talk about discipleship and bringing those who are outside the sheepfold back into the place where God our Father can nurture them through the love of Jesus Christ. With that said, my love, is there anything else you need to add to that? I don't need to, but it, it gave me hope just listening to you because as you said, our behavior, your behavior caused uh, the repercussions within your own family. Our behavior as Christians can cause hope, can give us hope that those who are lost in our family, I mean, it just made me think of hope that as we continuously seek the Lord and 
and walk the talk and pray the prayers and just believe God for his hand to move in the lives of those in our families or friends who are unrepentant, that gives us hope because he is alive and his spirit is, is alive in this earth. So it just gave me hope just to know that he is alive and that we can be those ambassadors of reconciliation <laughs> that we talked about the other week that, you know, as we pray, because sometimes we don't need to say anything, just pray for those to, and then pray that God could use us in some way to, to open their eyes, to make them hungry, to make them curious about how we are walking the walk or talking the talk. You know, not that we're perfect, but we, as you said, we're being perfected. So I have hope. It just, the, the word today just, it just gives me more hope. Amen. Amen. So, um, thank you, my dear. That's it. Basically, we do want to let you know that um, I was uh, stalling. You know, I said that we had a church engagement that we're getting ready to go to. Of course, I could not remember the name of the church. So Myra, while she was pontificating, I went and made sure I found the church. So, hey, guys, if you all are in the Maryland area, and you want a place to hang out around the 1030 hour, you can go to this church that is uh, named Bible Fellowship Church. It is at 120 Bar Berryman Lane. That is B-E-R-R-Y-M-A-N Lane in Town, Maryland. And hang out because guess what? Yours truly and yours truly <laughs> will be there uh, for the morning service and beyond the morning service. They basically according us today and we're, we're accepting it. <laughs> <laughs> we're accepting it. And I do need to say this final thing. Uh, it is an honor when a whole church or a whole assembly allows someone that they've never heard speak <laughs> and they've never heard either one of us speak to come into their place and literally give us the bulk of the service. So I want to just already um, to Pastor Jim Crocker, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Pastor Jim Crocker, we want to um, just on air thank him for that opportunity and we are excited. Um, I've been doing all my me, 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 me's because I'm supposed to sing a little bit. Hopefully you never know what's gonna happen till you get there, but nevertheless, um, we'll be dealing with everything related to missions. And I have a mission story to tell and Myra has a mission uh, ministry to share. And we'll be talking about more, uh, more of that in upcoming uh, Mac and Myra Sundays. But for now, we love you with the love of Jesus Christ. Be encouraged and be faithful. Be, be faithful knowing that your Father in heaven will never leave you nor forsake you. Let our hearts and minds be in Christ Jesus and watch our Father in heaven, show up and show out in wonderful and miraculous ways that you could never imagine. Won't he do it? God bless you. God bless.